Kevin took my criticisms pretty well, and it wasn't like that we disagreed or anything. Um, my main point was just that when you say like coordination or that like I'm coordinating and that everything is coordination, that in certain contexts and situations, it can kind of gloss over the power relationships that are in that specific context. Like I think the when you say because it's kind of like it's like reminiscent of saying, you know, there was some sort of like as if everything is just kind of like a miscommunication that like the commun that the coordination failure is just like, oh, we should have communicated better. We should have had better coordination mechanisms for X, Y, Z. And I'm totally like, I think that's that can be a very true statement. I think it's just that if you're looking at like the example that we used and we were talking about was uh, oil and gas uh, exploration, like if I'm an oil and gas executive, like it's definitely not like a miscommunication or a coordination failure that I'm continuing to extract oil and gas <laughs> from the ground and sell it to make money. That's yeah. sort of like the way that the system works and the reason that we can't tell the oil and gas executive like, hey, can you stop it? Or like, you know, we can't just say like, hey, I think there's been a miscommunication. You're supposed to not do that anymore because we don't want you to. Like, they're not going to listen to that, of course, because there's a power differential and there's like, you know, this system that people are embedded in that they can't necessarily break out of as an individual. And it requires, it requires coordination, of course, but it requires coordination towards some sort of collective action. And that means like fighting power. Yeah. So I, exactly. I think there's like a degree to which, in my view, coordination is basically just people coming together to do something. And the important question is, what are they actually going to come together to do? What are they trying to accomplish? And I think we often make the mistake of assuming that we can just sort of like set up a arbitrary abstract situation and then, you know, just kind of throw these sort of concepts or mechanisms at it. But there's a much broader social context that all this exists within. And I think to me, that's where we actually need to be more precise about the sort of goals of crypto or, of, you know, web three, quote unquote, as an ecosystem. So to me, it's, um, I don't know, everything is people, uh, people have to do things together. Uh, and then what are they doing together? What are we, what are we like trying to accomplish? And I think to that extent, coordination is like, it's a good thing to like outline, especially like when you're creating a new technology, because usually in like the modern age, that technology is going to be somewhat social. It's going to involve like people coordinating, like working together. But I think that like kind of explicit description of what we're trying to do is something that's been missing from the crypto ecosystem for a long time. Um, and in a way, it's been one of the strengths of the movement, because by not strictly defining, you know, exactly what we're coordinating towards people have from all different parts of sort of the political spectrum to the extent that exists. I don't necessarily believe that's the right mental framework. Uh, like they can all agree that they at least want to build some cool stuff and that cool stuff might eventually be useful. But I do think this is like kind of the point we're coming to now where we have this sort of question of, okay, we built all this infrastructure. What are we going to do with it? And I don't think in that context, we've actually really articulated, you know, what does meaningful adoption of crypto look like? What does meaningful, what is a real world use case of crypto look like? Um, and we have some of those that are starting to emerge, which is awesome. Um, by the way, I'm actually very, which we can get to like pro infrastructure. I think we actually don't have quite enough infrastructure, which is a hot take. <laughs> uh, but I think that like the real world applications have to be grounded in some kind of like truth about the world in terms of what we actually want to achieve, um, not just as a technology, but as a, a movement. And that's where I think we've lost a bit of the yeah. plot. I mean, I think I can I can understand the maybe strategic approach to uh, framing things in almost like a politically neutral way by saying like coordinate like by using the the meme of coordination to like bring people in. And I think 
no no matter where you are in the political spectrum like everyone's had the experience of like a giant miscommunication or a lack of coordination in some sort of social group that caused some sort of like negative outcome um but then indeed it were i think crypto is sort of like in this situation now where it's like okay we have all these people who are like they're interested in like coordination abstractly but we don't really know the the direction to go in so like then there's missing this um i don't know clear clear direction to go and my feeling is that this means that there is no like i i a, like it's hard for me to say that there is a crypto movement personally because i feel like it's made up of so many different uh like different groups with different beliefs and like ideas about what that future is supposed to look like so like you have i mean you have people who will say that like we need to like completely destruct the state and like create you know bitcoin as our our currency for the world and then you'll have other people who will say like we need blockchain to be mass adopted by all of the banks and like all these institutions that we have mass adoption for crypto and there's like this there's a tension inside of crypto that i think hasn't been dealt with yet but will need to be dealt with like it like it is like it is going to be dealt with in some capacity either like you know crypto gets adopted uh, gets mass adoption through like you know PayPal having their stablecoin becoming super popular or something like that or I mean maybe maybe the the you know crypto anarchists are right and the state does somehow collapse because everyone's using Bitcoin to pay for things. We need a uh, PayPal uh, you know uh, global world <laughs> government. That's uh, that's actually that's the future. Well, that, that's that's the worst. <laughs> PayPal habitat actually is very nice. It's a very it's a very nice habitat. They they provide a lot of like PayPal themed foods. A lot of um, billionaires as and well. And beverages. <laughs> I, I don't even know. A lot of a lot of yeah, a lot of billionaires. The PayPal mafia, you know, owns most of the property, but like that's, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I, I do think that like there's so yeah, like uh, this is an interesting question in the context of movement building because I, I've been thinking a lot about like historical movements. Um, and, and actually, this sort of ties back to like even like open source software as sort of like a cultural movement. Um, like Fred Turner has a really good book from uh, counterculture to cyberculture about like how essentially, you know, going back to like Stuart Brand and like the whole earth catalog, this movement was sort of first about like ideals and then sort of just tangentially about technology. And that sort of like shaped its, its development. But I think the interesting like question with crypto is like in, in some sense it is a movement, like it certainly is against, like certain certain outcomes, um, at least historically, if you go back to like its roots in like the cyberpunk movement, to the extent that it's like kept a single consistent thread around like what it stands for, I think that's definitely not true. Uh, it's, it's certainly alleviated from that. But I do think there's some value in uh, structuring our like thinking around it as a movement, because when you think about movements, they sort of go through life cycles. They um, they, they start, they sort of like grow, they like start to, you know, slow down and, and sort of reach this sort of, um, you know, top of the S curve. And then they sort of head into like some kind of mitosis. They, they, they fragment and they split. And, and I do think crypto is kind of in this phase now of splitting in this way where ultimately we need to figure out like, what is the actual sort of, you know, fork of this movement that we want to like really see reach some kind of mass adoption. And, and I do think that like, to, in my view, that's probably not the one where we just sort of end up being like, well, I guess, you know, the Salesforce <laughs> coin is doing really well. <laughs> We're going to see that like be, that's the future. But at the same time, I mean, without those sorts of players, like having some kind of say in the system, it, it will be challenging to like really make meaningful change. So you have this, this constant dichotomy or like, or like tension between movements that are really, really um, idealized, but really don't get anywhere. They're, it's very hard for them to like build momentum um, or they or they fragment too much um, they, because of like the rigidity of, of the movement itself. So like Occupy Wall Street is um, maybe an example of, on the one hand, like a movement that just kind of petered out because it had so many different directions. Um, and on the other hand, a movement like 
um, let's say the purely like free software movement is one that kind of ended up being red queened out of existence in a sense by like the fact that you had other sort of like open source players come in and say, we, we sort of want to like take this in a different direction. Um, and I'm not saying either of those, those are good outcomes, actually. Like I think both Occupy as a movement and the free software movement uh, had a lot of good to them in the sense of, you know, they were both very, they had strong idealistic visions. They had very principled kind of members, um, but they also didn't have the organization to like really reach like kind of uh, the sort of like level of scale to be like uh, meaningful, quote unquote, at a, you know, um, over a one, two decade period. And, and crypto is kind of getting to this point where it's like now at like, you know, the end of the first decade. And now it's like kind of halfway through the second. We're like, okay, what are we like? What is, what is the sort of like end goal of this? What is the like, you know, next stage of this? Um, in my view, it's possible to get too far in the other direction where you really just sacrifice everything to like make the movement go fast. You know, like this is like the, the constant problem of, um, you know, every well-intentioned uh, startup, um, like, you know, the, let's say hypothetically the, I'll, I'll say the anthropic problem. I won't even say the open AI problem, but like, Hey, we're going to like solve this, you know, AI safety problem. Actually just kidding. We're like going to build some more capacity for AI. Actually, uh, that seems like more profitable and it's not a probably fully fair characterization of, of that case. But on the one hand, yeah, in movements, you have this problem of like, these early stage kind of like deaths or like um, slowdowns of movements before they can, or, or mitosis of movements before they can reach adoption. And on the other hand, you have this like massive overgrowth of movements. And there's this very narrow corridor, like, which is like the problem with this, this sort of like framing is like, it's a very, and I think this is just like the thin line that we have to walk. Unfortunately, this, like this, this thin line basically is the only place where, we, the movement succeeds while retaining some notion of like the initial, initial values that it, that it had. Um, and I don't know how you think about that. I mean, that's, no. that's sort of like what came to mind, but I realized that's like a really long, <laughs> a really long rant. I mean, actually. it was, it's, uh, for me, it's reminiscent of a book that I really like called Neither Vertical Nor Horizontal by Rodrigo Nunez. Or he's, I mean, he's talking specifically about different left-wing movements, how um, sometimes there is this idea that we have two choices. Either we have a completely, hor like, anarchists, flat, horizontal movement, nobody has power, but everybody has power at the same time, kind of like Occupy Wall Street type of thing, or a completely vertical, highly organized, uh, highly disciplined, um, but much smaller group of people who are trying to initiate change. As if like those are the only two choices of like the organization problem is either that or the other, but he's trying to advocate for like a more, a much, much more nuanced sort of understanding of organization building and, and mass movement building that is kind of like, you know, diagonal in some way, I guess you could say that that has elements of both based on the context and situation that we're in and having like a plurality of different types of, of strategies and different types of organizations that are all working towards like a general, like same general kind of goal. Um, be, since historically, those are like the types of movements that have won. I mean, like the, the feminist movement uh, in the beginning, like won because it had many different types of organizations who all didn't agree with each other on a lot of things, but they were able to like reach like certain, certain larger goals that were really, um, that had a lot of like social progress. Um, so that's kind of what I think about, but maybe it's been about, <laughs> uh, about 14 minutes now. So I wanted to, um, pause the discussion to introduce my uh, guest today is Scott Moore. He is the co-founder of Gitcoin. Uh, he's also starting a new project called Public Works. He's a steward for a few other DAOs and is an advisor for Metagov. I've been uh, having the pleasure of being able to talk a lot with Scott the past like couple of months, I would say now. We just ended up being at like a lot of the same places and we've been having a lot of just back and forth of like interesting conversations. So it's nice to finally have one that's uh, recorded, <laughs> I think. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I feel like... Um... That's probably a good, honestly, starting point for 
any any discussion on the space because I think that this narrow corridor of like, which I think is actually what the author you mentioned is is probably also like in alignment with, is like probably the most important question that we actually have to answer as a space. Um, and I see like not that many people, uh, which, you know, maybe it's just a result of the fact that like there's already so many attacks on the space just naturally occurring that we have to defend against. Like I don't see a lot of people taking like an active approach to trying to articulate like what is the future like decade vision of the space itself. Um, but yeah, great to be here. Really enjoyed like our also unrecorded conversations. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully we can like, yeah, touch on some of those ideas here too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were like, so like we were just talking about, um, I was just like kind of summarizing a bit of the, what are the sort of discussion points that I had with Kevin Awaki on his uh, podcast Green Pill when I was on uh, not too long ago, talking about the book. Um, but yeah, there's kind of like this question of, I think this larger question of like coordination. And I think Gitcoin was one of the, I guess, the, kind of like the main rep, uh, organization i guess i was pushing the meme for for coordination the representative of the concept of coordination <laughs> yeah they, they were repping Generally. coordination as a concept <laughs> um yeah but i thought maybe we can in case people don't know who you are if you want to talk a bit about uh, about gitcoin and how yeah i guess a problem that I was initially trying to solve and and kind of what's come out of it the story behind it yeah so i feel like gitcoin has gone through a lot of iterations um I think one of the things which maybe isn't the right metric to really focus on, I don't want to like, you know, uh, end up in good heart's law, but like we've existed for about five and a half years, which by crypto standards is already a long time. Uh, and we've gone through like so many changes over that period. that It's hard to like encapsulate all of them, but the overall like original mission, and I'll try and keep this short. It was like, how do we actually fund open source software? Uh, as a sort of public good in a way that is equivalent to the way that, you know, other kinds of public goods locally get funded when there's a government, you know, a city or a state or a, 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 na a nation that can actually like facilitate and, and sort of um, maintain it. And historically, this has been a huge problem for open source software because you have all these maintainers who are really not that concerned uh, based on, as I was sort of saying before, like the historical cultural nature of open source uh, with money, um, but still need money to actually like exist. Um, it turns out we all sort of need money to like do things in the world. Unfortunately, um, at least currently, unfortunately, <laughs> um, I actually think money can be good in a David Graeber sense. There's lots of like, you know, uh, Ethan Buckman talks a lot about this, so I won't dwell on it, but like read his work on sort of the, the nature of money in crypto as sort of a, a, a means of sort of um, managing debt, very interesting stuff. But I think that like historically open source has been very to, to that, you know, same view, like anti-money. And what this has meant is that, you know, you have all these one security risks that come from that where like, like Heartbleed was a great example in 2014, uh, OpenSSL had this like heartbeat option. And essentially like there's this, um, like overread, um, where you could just pull in all this, like, uh, ostensibly private data and then get access to everyone's sort of accounts, uh, cause billions of dollars of economic damage because the, you know, in the XKTD sense, the one guy from Nebraska who was maintaining all these things, I actually don't think he was from Nebraska in that case, but that's the sort of comic. He was just doing this in his spare time. He had a job, he had a family and stuff he had to do in like the real world, so, so to speak. And he just ended up, you know, forgetting that, you know, there was this security vulnerability, I guess, that he was supposed to fix or maybe didn't see it. And, you know, part of the reason that happens is just because there's not funding for open source software in the same way as we have funding for roads and bridges and electrical grids. And the other problem is sort of, you know, more fundamental, which is because there's not really money in the system, uh, you don't really have a way to sort of account for, like, you know, thinking of money as a unit of account the work that people are doing in that system and giving them sort of a clear sense of ownership over the project as it grows. And so there's, there's sort of, you know, on the one hand, the problem here that emerges where maintainers don't necessarily want to give up control. Maintainers 
are, you know, usually one or two people that are just doing this on their own. Um, and you get this problem of there's no one to like kind of be in succession of them. But the other problem that emerges is, is that you don't really have community governance. And instead what happens is other larger corporate players come in and they say, wait a minute, like we can just give you like tons of money. Like we can, if your community isn't funding you, we can fund you, but we just want to be able to decide everything that happens in the project for like the next 10 years. And then of course, this creates like all these like larger problems for the broader open source community that they could have solved if they had been more sort of attentive to the money problem in the first place. So we, we started with the idea of just how do we fund these sort of like maintainers? Um, and it was very lucky that um, Vitalik, Zoe and, and Glenn had written this paper on like quadratic funding, which was not originally the intention of the grants tooling. It was just, let's get these maintainers some like funding and magic internet money. That seems like a good idea. And we just sort of realized this is a much better way to do it. It ends up being actually a great balance between, so like, you know, rank the way quadratic funding works in short is just, if you have like ranked choice voting, you can decide, you know, here are the top three choices I have of things that should be done or people that should be funded or whatever it might be. Uh, in quadratic funding, you're actually able to like instead measure the intensity of your preference with respect to each uh, potential option. So you might say, I actually like prefer option two, like pretty closely to like option one, but option three is like way down here. So I wanna really like showcase in my, my vote that I actually really care about option one and option two. And what it essentially, rather than just doing this with like, you know, a sort of vote or voice credit in quadratic funding as the name sort of suggests, you're doing this with, with money. So you're having a say in the project, but you're also in, in turn by having a say, giving them capital. And one of the benefits of this is not only that you get this like granular expression of your own preferences, but that you get the ability to fund the project as you see fit. And in turn, if lots of people do this, one of the nice properties of this particular model is just that like you're sort of, and I think actually a lot of your listeners might be familiar with this. So I'll, I'll stop here, but like you can actually collapse the preferences in a way that makes sure that whales or large funders are not like, you know, like the corporation in that example, like getting way too much say in how the project evolves or how the maintainer or a set of maintainers or ecosystem is funded. So that's the TLDR sort of how we ended up where we are with this quadratic funding stuff. Uh, it's been a really long road. There's a lot of stuff in between there in terms of models we tried, different approaches we took. Um, but, you know, the open source problem was kind of the the main part of this. It just happened actually that, you know, we've expanded beyond that because there's other kinds of public goods that are in this category, I'd say, of not just digital public goods, but global public goods that are just not really well funded uh, to tie it all together because of this coordination <laughs> failure. You know, I think that's actually mm. accurate in this case, which has to do with the incentives of each nation. They They don't care about things that are like beyond their borders. That's maybe, you know, spicy, but that's sort of my, my take. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I still feel that there's definitely a power relationship in the open source question as well. Just like, I mean, I, th I do think that corporations benefit quite a lot from open source, uh, development, of course, that's like, I don't think that's like difficult to, to, um, to say otherwise, just like the amount of open source that a lot of these people use. Um, Hold on one second. What? Sorry, my my music randomly turned on. <laughs> okay. The good news is I can't hear it. Yeah, so <laughs> it was just, assume... just really loud in my headphones. Just <laughs> like music. I was like, what the fuck? But yeah, so it's like it's the background. It's the, it's, the, it's part of the actual experience of like it's. I hope it was like an I don't know some kind of maybe a solemn classical piece. Just as you're talking about the <laughs> dangers of. Corporate governance. Over do, do, you, do you want to know? It was it was a Middle Eastern house music actually. <laughs> that was like a playlist. That sounds a lot there. more interesting actually. If you send me that after. I'm <laughs> sure. Really kind of curious. Dun 
Dona 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 So corporations benefit a lot from this like power imbalance with with developers. There are people who want to develop open source code, like hackers, people who want to uh, work on this stuff. If the state were to fund, you know, more consistently open source software, then it would potentially hurt corporations from being able to uh, exert as much influence. There is the other side, of course, on that. Like if the state is then... Uh, prioritizing what gets built and what doesn't like i don't know people may may make some sort of arguments uh for or against that i think it just depends on uh on the intentions of the states probably but the intentions of a corporation is usually pretty pretty much the same they want to make more money to me i think there is there's is still like it's still a it's a, also a coordination problem but it is also like one that is bounded by by power relations i guess in that sense. But I think what you guys have done with Gitcoin is kind of the the power relations are 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 st- are, are are there, I would say, but different. It it exists in a different way because it's it's more spread out in how the like how the money flows, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's always like you always have to be aware of those the dynamics. Like with the state example, that's that's a good one because like I think it's obvious to people generally speaking that like Hey, this big company is funding this thing. They probably really care about it for reasons that have to do with their bottom line. We should probably figure out what those are and like try and make sure that those things don't like conflict with the overall goals of like the project. But like with a state, it's I think people have the expectation in a lot of places that those kinds of actors are, you know, in, in a. It's actually interesting when it, when you talk to especially folks from like say Singapore about crypto. Um, like often, um, they'll say, you know, well, I don't really understand like the, the problem because like when I try and, you know, send this, you know, money transfer, when I try and use this public service, you know, it it just works. Like it seems fine. Uh, so people (laughs) don't really get it because the system hasn't like broken down to an extent that like you can see the cracks and you can like start to like really feel the difference in, in the quality of the system. But like, I do think that there's, um, you know, problems with state funding as well. But by, by the way, I would love it if the states funded open source software more. Right. I think that like, that would be great. I'm like for this. Alternatively, it would be nice if like we had some kind of, let's say like more mutualist system where people collectively decided to like fund things themselves on sort of a local grassroots basis. And that's sort of what the idea of like quadratic funding is in a sense. It's just like, how do you figure out what that group actually wants to do? And then how do you like bubble those opinions up so that you can like let other folks kind of view them clearly and then decide whether they want to support those opinions themselves about like what is important in a given local community. And I think that's something that is like not really, this kind of happens sometimes, although not as much as it should in like municipal governments. Um, This is like usually something that people kind of, make fun of, of where like, you know, the one person goes to town hall and like really complains about like the stop sign. Or something. <laughs> but like, I do think there's value to like that local participation, which, which can happen because there's like avenues for it in those environments. There's not really as much of an avenue for it in like a digital realm. That's kind of the main problem. It's like in, or, or with any of these global problems, because this, the scale the abstraction of the problem is so like high that like to try and, you know, Go like if you went to like your you know local council person or whatever like the equivalent is, and said, "Hey, like there's this library that I use for this like piece of software that I'm writing. Can you like help fix this problem I have?" They'd be like, "This has nothing to do with like my department." And I think that's where you sort of need to develop like more parallel like alternative systems, like mutualist systems, ideally in my view, that can facilitate this sort of work because otherwise it's just going to take forever to get done. You know, you can make arguments about like the bureaucracy or problems with the system or whatever you want. But like the, the main problem is just that like, there isn't really anything being uh, done. And so like, I think that's, that's the kind of thing that is, is something that we don't want to just feel like, I don't think Bitcoin should be the only organization doing this. Uh, that's actually a risk in itself. Actually, if Bitcoin is the organ- organization, that's just like the funder of these things. Uh, I think it has to be like a broad community effort. 
and, and Ethereum's a nice, like, there's a, I won't go into depth, but like, I think there's a nice sort of like way to view Ethereum as its own ecosystem. People talk about it as an ecosystem and it has its own monetary base, which is like perhaps one of the most important features because it means that you actually have control over the, you know, things like the money supply and things like the actual like economic model. And I think that's kind of a useful property of like the reason that Ethereum has been able to do more of this open source funding uh, than like previous eras of the internet is that we actually have this sort of like natural, like internet native way to like distribute value. But that's a whole different, I, I won't go deep on that mm. quite yet. Yeah. So the, one of the things that has come out of this, on this, on this kind of thread that you were, that you were pulling slightly, I mean, one, I think that Gitcoin is <clears throat> an interesting evolution in the Ethereum ecosystem for me, I think, just because in the beginning, all you had was sort of ICOs or venture capital as like the ways that people get funding. Um, maybe there were some grants, um, programs here and there, but it wasn't very big. Gitcoin made it sort of like a, like it's, it's like a a way that people can try and receive money um, that doesn't have like these strings attached to them for like having a return, which is interesting. And I think super necessary, like there has to be more Gitcoins and variations of Gitcoins, I think, in order for there to be much, much less uh, dependence on venture capital in the crypto world. That's like, you know, that's like straight up. I think crypto world should be get away from venture capital as much as possible. Um, but uh, one of the things that you guys did then is the creation of the Allo protocol, um, which is, I guess, like kind of like the open sourcing of the protocol that Gitcoin itself uses so that others can take it and apply it to their own uh, communities or organizations or what have you. Um, so do you want to talk a bit about um, about Allo? Yeah, for sure. I, and actually, I mean, I, I will say like, I actually am actually in agreement on the need for it, obviously like grants programs and so forth. But I also think venture capital is like not inherently bad, which is probably the hottest take. We'll disagree <laughs> for the, for the audience. I, Cause like here, here's the thing, right? Like the original sort of like vision of organizations like Bell Labs or Xerox Park was very much like having this sort of bundled economic model, right? Where, and this is sort of like, I think something that maps pretty well to like, mutualist thinking, uh, solidarity economics and so forth, you have like, okay, the thing that is like the research initiative that's going to like make, you know, kind of like money eventually, but it's like probably going to produce all these other externalities that like are not. And you want to figure out like, what is the way that you can, and this is actually something Vitalik's talked about too, in the context of like the sort of revenue evil curve, but like, how can you essentially take the thing, um, that like can be monetized without like restricting it or making it like, you know, less accessible, ideally, you know, as, as, you know, less, less accessible as possible. Like basically how can you reduce the amount that it's going to be like restricted by uh, the largest amount in order to make sure that like this thing is monetized so that you can go and fund other kinds of projects that, and subsidized projects that would otherwise, if they were monetized, be very much like, uh, like excludable. Um, there's probably a better way to phrase this, which is like, basically, how can you make sure that something like, say, in a city, you know, a subway system can make some form of money through transactions, you know, people using the subway system, like fees. This is kind of like analogous to Ethereum, you know, like the sort of subway system. Uh, sort of like transaction fees that are going in like funding parts of the ecosystem. Uh, you know, in this case, they're, you know, not being taken directly back into uh, a developer treasury, but I mean, you could do this with like contract security revenue or other, uh, other ideas, which I would actually recommend people look at, but like, how can you make sure that things like that, which are not really heavily excludable um, based on a small fee, are going and subsidizing, let's say a patent or like some other research initiative, which can then be opened up in a way where if it were not to be, it would just be like totally restricted, like closed off in a, in a box somewhere and not accessible to the community. And I think that's the sort of piece of the puzzle that the original sort of 
conception of venture capital in like the sort of like post Xerox Park, post Bell Labs era could have facilitated. This is like my hot take, but I think that it sort of failed to do that over time through perverse incentives and kind of this like need for endless growth. And I think that there's ways to change that model by just flipping essentially the dynamic between the initial funders of a project. This is like what ICOs did try to do, right? It's like change the dynamic between the initial funders and the uh, large scale, like eventual community for the project. And ideally, you know, you could just eventually have these sorts of projects be like funded by the community itself, shares like, or equivalent sort of like tokens be given to like each project and each member of each project. And then those people being sort of like direct sort of like contributors to the project over the long run uh, through not only their capital contributions, but also through like just their direct uh, sort of labor in the project itself. Um, this is kind of like what happens now when VCs say like, oh, but we are value add, we're gonna do all this stuff. It's gonna be like amazing. I think that like often falls short, um, partly because, you know, they are not really operating on that model anymore. Um, and partly because the size of these funds have grown so large that it's just impossible for them to really contribute to and like be sort of like providers of real labor in the projects that they're sort of invested in. So, you know, I think there's a sort of active, like almost like activist contributor model, uh, which I know some other folks have, have been sort of jamming on that could work a lot better um, but still kind of ends up being somewhat like similar to, or like isomorphic to like the overall, like venture capital quote unquote structure in the sense that it is looking for this, this return It is looking for this, like eventual surplus. And then the sort of solidarity economics element of this is really fundamentally that you want that to be redistributed back into the community. You want to have some kind of guarantee that this is not just going off to like, you know, create a yacht somewhere it's going to like actually do something back in the community and and so that's like one thing i want to quickly note on on the vc side because i do think that's like a misunderstood element of the sort of current maybe not of the current landscape it is a problem with the current landscape but a misunderstood element of like the original sort of idea of some of these research institutions like bell labs mm. i mean yeah i kind of think that there's still like for me what defines venture capital is really like, uh, I mean, mostly investment in tech products or investment in things that seem like tech products, but are actually just like, I don't know, real estate companies like WeWork. Um, and, and this is huge expectation. <laughs> Very true though. <laughs> and this huge expectation of return that is like beyond, uh, like, they're, they're, like venture capital used to be illegal. Like it was, it was not legalized until like fairly recently, like only a few decades ago or something like that. Um, and it immediately created this kind of like, it created the conditions for the tech bubble and all these other types of bubble, like financial speculative, um, you know, uh, periods of, of our time. Um, and like venture capital is, it's not a collective investment firm. You know, it's, it's, it's like a, there's a few people trying to make better returns than everyone else that they can extract the value for themselves. I think there is something to say for like, I think there is a spicy take to say that there is, there are similar things that a venture capital firm investment firm does that like some sort of collective uh, investment firm would do as well that makes sense or like even states even a state run you know social wealth fund that invests in different things would do similar things as a venture capital investment firm just because there is like there are similarities in what you're trying to do it's just like how you're whether that money or that return that you're making is being extracted for yourself or that's being reinvested into like whatever types of community or collective projects and so like i think like in an alternate reality where the DAO actually worked, like maybe that could have been something that it did. It would have been like interesting. Um, yeah. It probably would have failed, but it would have been like interesting to see how that went out. But I do see like, I mean, Gitcoin is still different because like it's like Gitcoin is not an investment firm, but it is doing, it is doing some form of like collective investment 
without necessarily the expectation of a return. Although, like, I think you can argue that, like, the, you know, the sponsors of the, of the quadratic pool are benefiting from the growth of the crypto ecosystem at large, perhaps. But it's, they can't, like, it, you know, you can't say for sure, like, me doing this will output this return in the way that, like, a venture capital uh, investment firm would, like, make these calculations or something. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that like, by the way, like even one of the, one of the things that I'm like noting here is, is like, I'm using the term venture capital just because like, that's the term that people I think are aware of. I don't think that's like, you know, that term comes with so much baggage that like, that's why I think it's a spicy thing to say, actually, it's not, <laughs> it's not always bad. Um, but I think that like, yeah, there's, there's sort of two components to this. One is, I think you want more collective capital pools that are essentially aimed at um, trying to essentially like uh, like give non-dilutive, like almost like free capital to a project that's like at an early stage. But you also want a way, and this is sort of the model that Optimism is doing, I think, a good job of like really stewarding to like reward people who have gone and created those types of projects that have then gone on to be very successful in the sense that they've been impactful in the ecosystem, you want them to still be able to go and like actually return, uh, you know, basically receive some kind of benefit that is commensurate with the value they've created. And you want that to probably be, I would say, be true for the early sort of sponsors essentially of that project as well, who kind of in a sense selflessly, although you know, you can talk about the dynamics of if this becomes a standard, suddenly does everyone expect they're going to have all these returns from, right. you know, going and giving to grants. This has actually happened in, in some of the grants rounds in Bitcoin where people have started airdrop farming uh, to try and see if they can, you know, catch sort of the next, uh, the next say optimism, which was in one of the early grants rounds and mm -hmm. did a distribution back to the community. Can you like, you know, in theory run into this problem with, uh, you know, or, or sorry, can you in theory like, you know, solve some of these dynamics by giving that incentive and uh, sort of like uh, that that return back to people without it being uh, an expectation or, or like a guarantee. And I think that's an interesting approach. I do think, you know, separately, just having even sort of a more cooperative model where people are just funding the project themselves with their community, with the expectation that, yeah, it'll have a business model. Yeah, it'll have like some kind of like sustainability, I think that's like an approach that would be okay in the sense that even with, you know, a, an organization like, like Desjardins, obviously like one of the largest cooperatives, like they, they are able to sustain themselves because they're, they're an insurance company basically, but they are cooperatively owned and they're providing essentially a service that is like then going back to cooperative members. And I would argue that like that sort of model is, is still relatively mutualist in, you know, this, the same sort of way that we would want to see with organizations in Web3. It's just that like, there's all this other mess of like bureaucracy and general sort of, you know, attachment to the existing financial system that something like Desjardins probably, you know, makes it a, a less compelling representative of uh, the sort of like cooperative movement. Mm. And so that's, that's sort of, you know, I think my take on the, the, the question to me is like, how do we create sustainable models that are iterating on the like notion of venture capital, but still retain this notion of one sustainability of the project and two of sort of meaningful returns surplus essentially. And if you get those two things, right, I think you can create a networked sort of like more mutualist economy because these projects can start to sustain each other. And in the way that I was mentioning sort of before, you can have this sort of, you know, tax, let's say on something congestible like the subway system in order to subsidize the increasing return of say, what would otherwise be a closed patent that's now producing positive externalities through being sort of left open, you know, to the broader ecosystem. But I also wanna make a distinction uh, between venture capital and early stage funding as a concept. I think projects should be encouraged to pursue 
community ownership more seriously. And I think investors should be more incentivized to cap the returns that they're taking in order to facilitate that community ownership. And I think this is not something that's possible with the current model uh, because of mostly winner take all dynamics and sort of like the fact that, you know, VCs are essentially passively investing in all these projects and aren't able to continuously gain rewards from actually participating and working with each project that they're investing in. And I think this is something that you can sort of fix in the current VC model by sort of taking the premise that you are really part of the team, you are part of the community, and you are working with them, hopefully for the next, you know, 10 plus years. And if you take that position, uh, you know, you can't take as many investments, you have limits on your time, you have limits on your capacity, and you can't expect 1000x, you know, billion dollar returns. But you can expect that you're going to have more sustainable, more long term oriented projects, and fundamentally, more mutualist projects. And I think that's the piece that the space should also try to consider. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we agree broadly, I think, you know, and the Allo protocol, I think is just a an interesting development to see how people take it and maybe modify it for uh, slightly different ends or like slightly different using the slightly different mechanisms using the, the protocol itself. Yeah. And so to answer the, cause I, I know you asked that like way back <laughs> at this point, uh, to answer the question about Allo, like, I, I think the interesting part about that system is it kind of goes back to the point earlier, like, you know, Gitcoin shouldn't be the only funder of these things, you know, similarly, I don't think that, you know, if we're even saying venture capital is good, like if I'm making that claim, I don't think that like A16Z should be like the only funder of these things. I think the fact that we have these like large billion dollar plus funds is actually like net negative. It like creates really weird market dynamics and like all these adverse sort of like selection problems. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I do think that having sort of all these different local communities that have their own sort of like various mechanisms that they can choose from which like Allo is sort of like aiming to help facilitate uh, that allow them to fund their own sort of shared needs, their own ideas and their own sort of community initiatives. That to me is the piece that I think is currently missing from our conception of I'm going to tie this all the way back to like the, the movement piece, like the, what web three, what like crypto is trying to accomplish. And what I mean is, you know, if you look at the history of crypto, it's a lot of speculation. It's a lot of like DeFi. It's a lot of like, more recently, like, you know, NFT uh, shilling sometimes disguised as like, you know, artist uh, uh, sort of uh, community support. Uh, and, and, and I think that's like, probably, you know, not net negative, but is like, directionally, in terms of the movement, in terms of the technology, it's, I think, interesting and provides a lot of like, new evolutionary sort of like primitives that are eventually going to do some cool stuff. But I think in terms of the movement, those things are less interesting and perhaps less impactful than just providing primitives for people to actually engage with and like sort of coordinate around their own shared community. And that's where you can start to be more like tangible about, you know, the actual impact that this stuff is having, because you're not just talking about like the Web3 ecosystem or the crypto ecosystem, you're talking about a you know, uh, you know, tech community in Lagos, you're talking about like a community currency in Oakland, you're talking about like, you know, actual sort of people using this in their daily lives. Now, mm -hmm. to be sure, we need a lot more actual improvements in like UX and overall sort of usability of crypto. For example, account abstraction is like a great step towards this to me for this to be actually useful. There are people that are probably going to like, you know, not want to just store two thousand dollars on like their phone to walk around with uh and and try and transact with on a daily basis but i do think there's like you know we're starting to see with things like allo and others or tools this ecosystem of projects form and this this general movement around sort of i guess you know something that like folks have now called like regenerative or like mm. more sort of impact focused uh, sort of applications starting to form. Yeah. 
So we've talked about funding. Another thing that I want to talk about uh, with you is DAOs because Gitcoin is, I mean, one of the, I guess, larger DAOs out there. Um, and you were part of the process, of course, like being the founder or being one of the founders and then, you know, going through the process of turning it into a DAO. Uh, do you want to talk about that process a bit and like, I don't know, your thoughts on DAOs now after like really um, exerting a lot of like effort and labor into, into making that happen and kind of the, um, the difficulties that were involved with that. Since I think there's a lot of people interested in crypto who like, they have an idea for an organization, they want to build it and then they want to like turn it into a DAO. It's like, like what are the things that, you know, people should expect if they want to take on such a, such a task? Oh man. I mean, I think that there's lots of really interesting parts of what DAOs can accomplish. And then there's a lot of just, you know, the bumps along the way that I think people maybe don't prepare for or sure. don't necessarily maybe don't talk about, um, or in the bull market, people didn't talk about them. Now that it's a bear market, I think everyone kind of like talks about everything being, you know, worse or, or <laughs> you know, less, less impactful than it was. Yeah. Um, it kind of swings in, you know, extremes people like either like everything's going to be an amazing utopia or everything is immediately going to like, you know, fall apart. Um, and I think it's yeah, the truth is probably somewhere in between, but I think that what I like about DAOs is that you didn't really have sort of internet native mechanisms for distributing value to groups of contributors in a way that was like, um, one relatively like seamless and transparent, but two also like that, like allowed for these other, like less common, more equitable structures, like say cooperatives that otherwise would be like kind of a pain to instantiate, uh, locally, let alone like across, like all these contributors from all over the world. And I think that the ability to do that now in the sort of Ethereum space is actually quite novel and, and quite useful, even in cases that like, you know, might eventually just be like real world cooperatives. I think the other piece of this that's interesting about DAOs is a lot of these sorts of projects can actually do this with their own sort of currencies. They can do this with currencies that reflect their sort of internal values. They reflect the goals that they're trying to accomplish. They also reflect their internal uh, sort of economic or like social principles. And those are things that I think were not really very easy to do, uh, you know, at scale in other, other cases. You had mm. mini currency experiments in the past, like, you know, even back like hundreds and hundreds of years, but like, especially in like the seventies and eighties, I think there was a pretty famous experiment in Ireland in, in the eighties. Those are, you know, I think the prototypes of what I hope DAOs can sort of accomplish and become in like, you know, the next sort of cycle, but the downside of DAOs is that um, there's lots of great history on best practices for organizations, you know, trade-offs between like efficiency and like resilience of organizations, trade-offs between scale and, you know, overall alignment, uh, trade-offs between the, you know, amount of, this is sort of the good hearts law part, like the, the amount of, you know, measurements or KPIs you put in place and the propensity of your organization to like overfit on certain objectives that are, or metrics that are hit. The downside of DAOs in those contexts, I think are only now sort of being resolved. Um, and it probably took like the ecosystem on the whole, like, you know, two, three years to sort of realize those things. But I think one of the, one of the downsides is, you know, it's a new term, it's a new concept, it's a new sort of like, uh, like design space. And, and so people kind of forget that there was other stuff that like previously existed that we could like draw from in terms of approaches or models. Um, so that's like the downside It's like, I think that the, the, the good part of DAOs is we should use them to create new types of organizations that are actually aiming towards like globally distributed common goals. Mm -hmm. The downside of DAOs is that like, uh, you still have to do a lot of organization. You still have to like actually do all this coordination. Uh, and that is the part of coordination that I think is like really the, the emphasis, uh, actually is like this sort of like, uh, change from, um, 
you know, you all hang out in like a small garage, sort of like the, the meme of like the startup in the Silicon Valley era uh, to, okay, we have like this like online sort of community that we're all sort of coordinating around um, and we're all trying to engage and sort of make sure is like heard. And how do we make sure we do that in a way that like is uh, sort of like consistent and also leads to like long-term uh, sustainability of the project, like maintenance of like, you know, core tooling, uh, maintenance of like the initial values and, and uh, sort of mission. These are all things that I think, you know, again, like a lot of historical literature on organizational design sort of like has addressed and like solves for, mm. but I think it's something that is, um, like what I hope that DAOs can sort of like quote unquote, like bring online, or I guess as people would say now, like bring on chain. <laughs> um, although we have to define what that term means, uh, I think more clearly. Um, so that's, I guess like at a high level, I think DAOs are pretty cool. Uh, I like DAOs. I think we've like, you know, sort of seen a lot of the the benefits of, of the DAO through just like the fact that we've like now like shipped this protocol, this like community is now sort of like grown. And I've also been able to sort of like step away from the DAO myself, like with relative confidence in the team and the community that is sort of operating it. And I think that's something that like is pretty interesting because it's a hard thing to do probably in, you know, a, even a regular organization. And I think the fact that we've been able to sort of see that in the context of the DAO has been uh, sort of like, to me, a sign that they can work, but I don't, you know, think that's um, a sign that like they're perfect. I think there's like still a ton of like, you know, organizational sort of like debt that probably every DAO, including ours is still like, you know, making sure we're recovering. Mm. So <laughs> I guess it's a good thing. You still like DAOs after trying to make one. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's actually like probably another hot take. I don't know if that's spicy. Like, I feel like there's a lot of people that have written, especially in this market, like a lot of like much spicier, uh, spicier yeah. pieces on like how DAOs are, you know, doomed. We're like DAOs are over. We're mm -hmm. so you know, same with tokens. The people are like very bearish on anything to do with the token now. It's like as like as if this hasn't had like multiple cycles and iterations of of token models that people have like written, you know, books and and tons of like literature on mm -hmm. um but i i do think it's like it is a good sign yeah um feel free to edit this part out i'm just kind of i'm rambling here it's like, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll cut this well i mean i think what is interesting is that and i've said this like multiple times before but like how i've witnessed kind of like the the people who are interested in DAOs online sort of like more and more become interested as they try to do a DAO in like a very idealistic sense and where it usually kind of fails and then look into, oh, cooperatives have already done similar things or, oh, there's already been, you know, people thinking about decentralized organizing and, and what does that mean? I think there wasn't this because a lot of people came from, you know, uh, I don't know, traditional working corporate backgrounds that the, I think it wasn't internalized like the real difference with having, you know, reporting to your manager and this like centralized pyramid hierarchy versus, you know, a DAO, which is in the most idealistic sense, like the kind of organization that's owned by a whole lot more people and that has a lot more um, decentralized uh, structure of ownership. And this different structure of ownership requires a different form of relating with one another and acting towards one another than, than a centralized one. Um, and yeah, this is, it's not a, it's not a new problem, but it's like a, uh, a problem that still, I think we need to figure out or get better at doing so that we can then socially reproduce more organizations that are more democratically run and democratically owned. Um, so that to me is why, why DAOs, DAOs are interesting. It's giving that space for people to, to experiment, um, mostly fail, I think in the beginning, but at least experiment so that they can, that, that's like the only way they're going to get to, to the point where we can do it more, more frequently. The pro of this, like, there's like these death and rebirth cycles, which I was saying like are bad in the sense that, you know, DAOs are this blank canvas that we can like kind of 
work off of. And people take that to mean like, let's just like try all the things, you yeah. know, again, that people have like already gotten a, you know, a decent handle on. But I think that the, the sort of like benefit of that is that you get the ability to run way more experiments in parallel, like much faster. And if you can collectively like learn from those experiments and also like collectively share value between those experiments, this kind of goes back to like, you know, in my view, like why you need this ability to share value, like as an ecosystem and like return value as an ecosystem. Like, I think that can be something that's useful for the long run, none of the, you know, crypto TM sort of space, but also just like of the way we organize generally. Um, the other point I'll mention on that just quickly is like, I think one of the things that we're unlearning through the process of creating DAOs just as a space is we historically are very, I think, yeah, used to hierarchy. We're used to like the notion of like, to your point, having a manager. And I think it's actually very hard to unlearn that for a lot of people. Um, we sort of have like been trained to like have less agency, I think generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that means in practice is that like you sort of, you know, people will like join a, a channel or like, you know, join an initiative and they'll be like, okay, like I'm here, like, please give me like, you know, the full rundown on everything that like I should be doing. And people are like, wait, who are you? Like, what, what are we, what are we doing here? Like, and I think that's um, the sort of challenge is, is to get people to unlearn this sort of like sense of um, uh, needing to be, you know, instructed, needing to be like managed. Um, not that management is necessarily always bad. Like I think it's a, there's nuance to these things. Right. And I think that, um, there's one thing here I want to just like make sure people read that is like, for me, an inspiration on this, which is, um, Yvonne Illich has a few books on this, but like de-schooling society is one in particular that I think is like really great in terms of sort of articulating the way we have abstracted sort of like what were previously like way back, you know, like personal relationships with each other two more institutional abstracted sort of bodies that, you know, uh, and, and what that's done over time is, has essentially been like, it's created this, this sense of like learned helplessness, uh, mm. I think, unfortunately, in like a way that we can probably, you know, and I see people recovering, uh, like it from like, in, and kind of like improving from, but it's like, I think still fundamentally, um, a challenge, especially because, you know, all of us still exist in a quote unquote real world where uh, these are still the standard modes of operating. We haven't really changed any of that yet. So, um, I think that's just a super important, like part of, and, and like maybe like, you know, in addition to the fact that you have this like benefit of experimentation and sort of like this iteration on new ideas and, and models and this sort of like, you know, change in the way that we're thinking about like organizational structure and your own agency. I think there's also maybe like just ideally benefits to just our realization that this is all kind of made up that like all these other pieces of like organizational, you know, structure that have existed are just building blocks that you can choose basically to use based on context and based on like whether or not they fit what you're trying to accomplish. You should still know what the building blocks are, but like you can use them in ways that are much more like sort of modular or configurable based on your actual, your actual needs. And I think even just that like psychological, social realization that crypto has allowed people to have about like, oh yeah, like the world is just like made by people and I'm a person and I can make things <laughs> is like, I think a useful shift that didn't really happen, you know, in wasn't, wasn't really a big part of the conversation, I think in the past sort of decades. Yeah, I think I think I think it was Graeber that said like the secret like the great secret of the world or something like that is that you can change it. <laughs> I'm definitely butchering it, but something like that. Yeah, yeah, it was um I think it's from uh is it from Utopia of Rules? Uh, it might be from But yeah, some it's like the great secret of the world is that, you know, uh it's yeah, let's cut this part out. I'm going <laughs> to leave that. I think you got it. Yeah. I don't have a better way to phrase it than you. I don't remember either, actually. <laughs> um, but so the newest project that you've undertaken since and now you're kind of phasing out of Gitcoin and pursuing 
um, this new thing called public works. Uh, would you talk? Would you like to talk a bit about that and what are the goals of that project? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, this might be part of the reason that I'm like interested in, at least to some extent, defending the notion of of investment. Uh, I think that ultimately the goal of public works is to showcase that there are certain types of infrastructure that one we're missing in the space in a world where even you know as I was saying like we need more sort of real world adoption but like one of the ways you do that is by creating tools that make that adoption easier uh, so like an example would be in like previous cycle like I think Wall Connect played a critical role in things like Rainbow being widely adopted which played a critical role in things like NFT marketplaces being used. And although I don't always agree with like the way those NFT marketplaces were used, it was still like pretty important that you had this sort of like fundamental building block in the case of Wall Connect that led to people wanting to uh, actually interact with, with crypto at all. And so I think in the next sort of cycle, there's other types of infrastructure like that, um, which have now sort of become, I think, talking points that other people can cover in more depth, they've, they've become sort of memes in the space in their own right. But things like account abstraction, uh, things like intense based tooling, uh, things like better even just developer tooling have become parts of, I think, a conversation that is sort of uh, split between, you know, hey, we like have more than enough infrastructure, you know, why are we building more sort of the same thing? And this is kind of true sometimes with like some of the infrastructure, like we just probably don't need more block space at this point. I don't know why we keep creating more block space. Uh, again, exceptions to probably spicy, everything. Spicy, spicy. But there's also a question of, you know, on the other hand, like what are the sort of missing core pieces of the tech tree? You know, if we sort of think of it that way that like we need to actually get to some, you know, sort of mass adoption in the future. And I think, of those ones I mentioned, like account abstraction is probably the most tangible where people, I do think, really understand that this is kind of necessary. Um, and so the goal of public works in a way is to be able to actually like invest in these sorts of projects, but to sort of encourage them ideally to like exit to community in a way that is, you know, as I was mentioning, more in line with the sort of mutualist framing of the way that community ownership and sort of community investment should work. And I think that this is a very tricky thing to do properly, but like if done right, this can hopefully reframe the way that we view things like venture capital today. Because again, like I don't think venture capital is inherently bad. I know we're going to disagree on that. I also think there's a lot of nuance to that. But I do think that venture capital as it exists today uh, is pretty broken and is largely reliance on like a handful of, you know, smaller organizations that are basically just trying to like get projects to like, you know, billion dollar plus valuations and are trying to essentially, you know, create winner or take all like monopolistic markets rather than trying to create like pluralistic sets of infrastructure that are more modular that people can like actually kind of work together on. And ideally, you know, essentially invest together on. And I think that this is, um, by the way, like, I guess I should state, cause I don't know, like, you know, I'm not in the U S but it, I don't mean invest here necessarily in the sense of a financial or, you know, economic contract. I mean, in the sense of having some kind of governance stake over the project itself, et cetera, et cetera. That's just my disclaimer. Cause who knows how the U S regulatory environment will actually uh, end up. But I do think, my point is that like, if you can reframe this model and change some of those functions and like features of existing VC, then you can sort of at least start incrementally improving the sort of path to this like fully sort of peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem, which by the way, like I would actually argue in some ways that like we sort of had closer to in the ICO era, there was way less accountability to projects in the ICO era, but at least we had sort of like direct community investment. Um, probably legally, you couldn't do that today. But like, I think that this sort of is something that will naturally, I think, need to be facilitated by at least some key players. It's not something that will like happen on its own, because the existing forces in the market are just so large at this point, and like, so like, kind of like, 
uh, oligopolistic that like, it's hard to imagine tons of new entrants coming in to like, basically help pull projects from this sort of like venture capital pipeline to a more community oriented pipeline uh, without like some kind of interference or some kind of like uh, engagement. And, and I think that's like probably something that on our own as a sort of fund, we can't, act, we, we can't accomplish that. Like as me and like, you know, two other people, I think we can accomplish that if we pluralistically get lots of smaller groups engaged on this idea. And that's where I hope that we can sort of like start to spread the message and start to get people engaged. Um, I've actually had a lot of conversations with uh, folks who are interested in sort of like this activist contributor model, folks that are interested in a sort of broader approach to um, like early funding. And I do think that there's sort of a movement starting here, um, but it's a bit of an uphill battle, right? Because on the one hand, you know, to your point, people hate venture capital or anything that's like associated with like early stage funding, uh, which has some kind of like economic arrangement. Uh, on the other hand, um, you have people that, uh, you know, I think are reluctant to uh, change their sort of ways or like, or, or adjust their models because, you know, the large funds, these large organizations are doing perfectly well. Yeah. They're benefiting uh, from it anyways. Sort of in their current, in their current state. Yeah. So it's a question of like, I think, you know, what we're trying to do is really just like very simply like invest in ecosystem infrastructure that will be useful for like, hopefully like this next wave of actual adoption. But I think the, the, the bigger question is like, how do we actually restructure the way that like capital flows in this space, which is like going to be for at least the foreseeable future, quite heavily financialized. And then how can we slowly shift towards a model where we're actually valuing labor and valuing contribution, uh, especially at an early stage more. And so it's, it's tricky. It's like, you know, I think it's a, it's a probably, it's probably too early to tell exactly how that'll actually play out. But to me, this is something that I think is, has been sort of on my mind for a while because we actually saw this with um, Gitcoin early on where you had projects like Uniswap or projects like Optimism or projects like uh, XDAI, uh, which did, you know, I think the right thing in the context that they were in, they raised, you know, uh, capital to like increasingly grow with the community, grow with the ecosystem that they were building. At the same time, I think that like generally, um, you know, the sort of like early supporters of those projects may not have like, you know, wanted them to go and, you know, raise successive venture capital rounds only to like sort of exit the community three, four years down the road. And that to me is the thing that like, we're already, so like my point is essentially we're already seeing this happen. Like we already saw this play out and now sort of we're in this lull, I think as people sort of recover from the insanity that just happened in 2021, 2022, how can we make sure that like in 2024, 2025, there's not the same dynamic. And again, you know, spicy take, I think it's going to be like controversial. I think it's going to be interesting. Um, and I'm excited for it because I think, I think it's necessary. Yeah. I mean, like when I think of venture capital, I think I have a, a very specific like image in my head of, of what that is and, and what that looks like when I, when I talk about it, I've definitely, <clears throat> I've met, you know, especially recently, just because of all the conferences I've been going to, like meeting all these VC people that. I mean, don't look like they're VCs in the first place. They're like, they're like not suits, I guess. And <laughs> and they're like, you know, they, they talk about how they want collective, like they're that they themselves are interested in like collective ownership. And that's why they invest in crypto and like whatever, like more, I think they're like more progressive causes, I guess, through their venture capital. I guess I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that it will all turn out okay, just considering like larger incentives of the system. I think that there will be, I think there could be certainly like some important wins with a kind of like strategic, very strategic, very like not succumbing to like Moloch maybe um, with this like venture capital investment that could be pretty good. Yeah. Like to me, like I want, 
I want like a giant system where people are all able to collectively decide where we want to put our collective capital towards places to grow, you know, the system larger, which I think is what a lot of people want. It's just like not an easy thing to to organize and create. I think that's gonna, that's going to take a, a a huge effort, probably. Yeah, I mean, I think like most people in the sort of same section of crypto that like we're in, I think want that. I think the hard part is like, you know, kind of follow through on the results. And I think yeah. that like the hardest part is like, to your point, like, you know, the sort of people in crypto conferences that are like saying that, like, I think a question to me is like, you know, how, how much are you like saying things versus like living those values, which is like a constant challenge yeah. in the space. Like, I think a lot of people like have perspectives on things. Like a lot of people have opinions, uh, which is, <laughs> you know, including easy to have opinions, (laughs) easy to have opinions, but it's harder to like make sort of actions, uh, take action that like actually furthers those opinions in a meaningful way. Um, I think this is like one of the reasons I've like been a little bit less active on like, you know, Twitter, like any equivalents is just like, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of distance between the, the people that are like really actively building and the people that are like, uh, have, opinions. Uh, <laughs> and I think that like, that's like, also, again, nuance to that. Like, I think there's lots of great people on those too. But like, that to me is um, something that like, I think needs to just like, take time to play out. And I hope that like, the sort of the sort of end goal here is, is that we get to essentially much more of a peer to peer system. To be honest, if we could just like, recreate, uh, you know, better versions of like, the sort of like initial like capital and labor contributor model like that like something like an ICO created i think that actually could be like much more interesting the problem is mostly uh making that happen in a way that doesn't lead to like either people in jail or people like generally um sort of finding ways to game that system yeah at least right now yeah and so i think that like that sort of that's the path we're on, but I think that it'll take some time uh, to get there. The the organization I would mention, by the way, that I think is like actually interesting to view from a like more mutualist anarchist perspective on this would be like C4SS, right? Like I think they sort of have a, a much more market based perspective on like uh, more still like mutualist uh, like market based uh, anarchism, um, and I think that to me is an interesting sort of like model that we could potentially again you know question marks on the implementation details port over to the sort of like crypto ecosystem Mm. yeah interesting yeah there's um i mean there is this kind of like provocation from i think c4ss and also from people like yanis Varoufakis of like how how do we use markets without capitalism or how do we have markets without capitalism which i think is uh, yes an interesting provocation. Um, last question I wanted to ask you. You've had a lot of spicy takes. What is your spiciest take that you would like to leave the audience with? Oh, damn. I feel like I've already given some of these spicy <laughs> takes. Um, probably the spiciest take is that we still haven't really, you know, as an ecosystem proven, this maybe is a good way to tie back to the very beginning, like proven why we're here. I think there's still a lot of like open questions, a lot of like things left undefined, a lot of like details that we sort of should be filling in, especially around what the movement of crypto is about. And of course there's the origins sort of in the sort of cypherpunk movement and so forth, but I would love to see us come together and sort of articulate, you know, pluralistically a vision for what we really want this to be in 10 years. And I think, that's part of like, for me, the motivation of like, you know, what does this sort of like tech tree look like? But it's also a question of like, I think mapping out um, and and uh, Vitalik has done actually a really great job of this with like his recent posts, maybe not that recent now, uh, as when this is released uh, around sort of the real world applications that he would like to see. Um, but I think I would love to see more sort of uh, of a map on not just the tech sort of tree, but also on the sort of like movement um, as to like, you know, where we want to go in the coming years. Um, 
maybe that's not a spicy take. There's probably spicier ones scattered throughout this, <laughs> but that's one that I think is is really important for us to just consider um, and to take away. Cool. Thanks so much for coming on. I think people can find you and follow you on like most places, including Twitter, not Scott Moore. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, not Scott Moore on Twitter, but like I think um, increasingly uh, feel free to just go to like publicworks.fm, uh, send me a note. Um, I'll be sort of like available on any of the channels that are in there. And in general, um, would love to chat to folks just that are interested in these concepts. Um, trying to start to do a little bit more writing on these as well. Um, so if you want to collaborate on some writing, uh, feel free to hit me up. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you.